Okay, so I guess turtle doves would need a medium, but geese? They probably need a large, right? Hey, Pete, you got a second? Sure, what's up? I'm trying to figure out how many bird cages I would need. Bird cages? Wait, what are you even talking about? You know in that song where someone's true love gets them all those birds for Christmas? Um, do you mean the 12 days of Christmas? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are other presents in there besides birds. Oh, really? Name one. Okay. There's, uh, the, uh, oh, the five onion rings. Um, I know there's some kind of golden rings, but I don't recall that they were golden brown delicious appetizers. I'm just saying, there's got to be at least one non-bird in there. Okay, but... Most of them are birds, so I think we'd need a lot of cages. I mean, can you even put French hens in the same cage as partridges? Don't the partridges just stay in their trees? I don't know. What do I look like, the host of the bird club? No, we're the hosts of the math club. And speaking of which, hey there, math club. Season's greetings. Happy holidays from both of us to all of you. Well, it's definitely the holiday season. And I've been hearing all kinds of holiday music lately. And like, didn't we just have Thanksgiving? Totally. I, I think I have already hit my limit on that Mariah Carey song. But yeah, definitely. Um, the 12 days of Christmas was reminding me of a fun math problem about how many gifts the singer gets from their true love. Well, even if it's just the birds, that's already got to be a lot. And then a single bag of bird seed on any of the days. I, this seems less like a gift and more like an inconvenience the more I think about it. Okay, but putting the birds aside for a sec, the problem of counting all the gifts reminded me of a story about Carl Friedrich Gauss. Oh, I think I know the one you're talking about because I used to share that story with my students when I taught fifth grade. Because in the version of the story that I remember... Gauss was about that age when this story took place. Yeah, well, I think this would be interesting. Can you go ahead and tell that story now? Just kind of how you used to tell it to your students? Sure. Here's how I remember the story going. One day when Gauss was in grade school, his teacher wanted to give the class a task that would take them a little while to complete. So he asked them to add up all the numbers between one and a hundred. So like one plus two plus three plus four plus five all the way up to 100 and figure out what the sum total was. So the teacher goes and sits at his desk. All the kids are sitting there computing away. But within about a minute, Gauss walks up to the front of the room and puts his work down on the table like he's done. The teacher is just in stunned disbelief that a kid would have the audacity to pretend to be done with this that fast. So he walks over and picks up Gauss's work and what's written there, but the correct answer, 5,050. So he asks Gauss, how did you figure this out so fast? And Gauss explains that he noticed a sort of a pattern. If you take the first number in the list and the last number in the list, one and a hundred, and add them together, it makes a hundred one. If you take the next two numbers in, the two and the 99, and add them together, they also make a hundred one. So do three and 98 and four and 97. In fact, you can keep going this way, getting pairs of a hundred one, all the way up to 50 plus 51, which are at the center of the list. At that point, all Gauss had to do was figure out what 50 times 101 is, and he got the answer, 5,050. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, you know, that's very similar to the version of the story that I heard. And when I was thinking through this episode and planning out some of the things that we might want to talk about, I did a little research to see where does this story come from? Like, where is the first version of this story? I kind of wanted to check some details out and see if I was remembering it correctly. And I found out something really interesting. What's that? That actually nobody really knows where this story came from. And yet all of us can rattle off all of the details. Gauss was in elementary school. He was given a task that was either busy work or it was meant to be a punishment. And the task was to add up the numbers one through a hundred and that he did it very quickly. And in fact, he did it in exactly the way that you described. That's the story. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Well, 
I found a very interesting article by a scientist and mathematical journalist named Brian Hayes. The article is called Gauss's Day of Reckoning, and it appeared in an issue of American Scientist. And he took on exactly this question of what really happened to Gauss. And he traced it all the way back to what he thinks has to be one of the very first references to this story. And it was written in 1856, which is the year after Gauss died. And it was written by somebody who was also at the same college that Gauss was at, namely the university in Göttingen. So is that earliest version of the story pretty similar to the version I just said? The answer is kind of. So let me read a little segment of it. This was written by a professor at Göttingen University. His name was Wolfgang Sartorius. And here's what he wrote. Here occurred an incident which Gauss often related in old age with amusement and relish. In this class that he was in, the pupil who first finished his example in arithmetic was to place his slate in the middle of a large table. On top of this, the second placed his slate and so on. The young Gauss had just entered the class when the teacher gave out for a problem the summing of an arithmetic series. The problem was barely stated before Gauss threw his slate on the table with the words, there it lies. Okay, that's the extent of it. No mention of what the problem was, no mention of how the problem was solved, just that Gauss was given this problem, he solved it very quickly, and he threw his slate on the table. So according to Brian Hayes, possibly the two most interesting parts of the story don't even appear in the original version of the story. Yeah, that's right. And, and so what I think is so interesting about this story is it's sort of already it's couched in, well, I knew this guy named Gauss and he used to love telling this story. And what Sartorius leaves out what are now the, like the stock details. It's like everybody would say, oh yeah, Gauss added one up to a hundred and got 50, 50. So I don't know. I thought that, that was very interesting. Like, Maybe that story happened, maybe it didn't, or maybe it happened differently. But this article, which we'll link in the show notes, goes on to discuss all kinds of interesting things about this problem. You know, what's interesting to me, Keith, is that if Gauss didn't think up this method for solving the problem, at some point after this story took place, someone thought it up because we have it now. So somebody had the brilliant insight that Gauss had, right? Yeah, and I think in this article by Brian Hayes, he also gives a telling of the story. And in it, he notes that, hey, that smart kid that got the problem right went on to become perhaps the greatest mathematician of all time. So whether or not Gauss did or didn't solve this particular problem at a young age, he certainly looms large as a mathematical genius. But what's interesting is that by 1938, the story had morphed and it was then being told using the sum of numbers one through 100, equaling 50-50, and the technique was even attributed to Gauss in that telling of it. So somewhere along the line, this formula was known to somebody and it got attributed to Gauss. All right. Well, even though it's a matter of some debate whether Gauss ever actually had to tackle this problem in grade school. Let's now talk about some other ways that this problem could be approached. Oh, sure. I think there's a subtle variation on the approach that you gave us, this approach of pairing the first and last number, the second and second to last number, and so forth. That, that's a way where you sort of fold this series of numbers in half and the numbers pair up with a constant sum going all the way down the list. Another way to picture this would be to imagine that you have written down the numbers 1 through 100. Beneath that, write the numbers 1 through 100 a second time, but in reverse order. So you write the 100 underneath the 1, you write 99 underneath the 2, and so forth, all the way down the line until you've got the 1 sitting beneath the 100 in the top row. Well, each column now clearly adds up to 101, and because you have two rows, together they add up to double the sum that we want. So if you have 100 
101s, that adds up to 10,100, cut it in half, and there's your 50-50. Oh, okay, I see. One thing I like about the two-row approach is that you don't have to worry about, well, if I'm supposed to fold my list in half, what if I have an odd number in my list? What if the original problem was to add the numbers 1 through 99? So how would you do that? Oh, I see what you mean, because when you fold it in half, it would be right in the middle of one of the numbers. I suppose, though, you could add a zero right before the one so that now you would have an even number of items in the list, and then you could fold it in half. And adding that zero to the 99 when you folded it around would still give you 99, just like 1 plus 98 would give you 99, and 2 plus 97 would give you 99. That would work, right? Yeah. In fact, that's a great idea. I really love that. I've never heard it before. You totally could do that. Clearly, I'm the math expert between the two of us. I am too smart. I am too smart. S-M-R-T. I mean, S-M-A-R-T. So are there any other strategies you could use to solve this problem that are totally different from this one? Yeah, there is. Here's a cool idea that is based on an observation about averages. So if you have any finite set of numbers, doesn't matter whether the numbers form an arithmetic progression or not, they don't have to be a sequence of consecutive numbers, then the sum of that finite set of numbers is equal to the average of the set multiplied by the number of elements in the set. Wait a second, wait a second. If you know the average of a group of numbers and you know how many numbers are in the set, you can figure out the sum. Let me, let me think about that for a second. The way that I would figure out the average of a group of numbers is I would add them all at first and get the sum. I would take the sum and divide it by how many things are in the group, and that would give me the average. Oh, I see. So it's doing that backwards. If I know the average and I multiply it by how many things are in the group, that will take me back up to the sum of all of the numbers in the group. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, in general, it's going to be hard to figure out what the average is. That seems like, how do I get that if I didn't already know the sum? Well, for an arithmetic sequence, like the kind we're talking about here, there's a shortcut. And that's what we want to think about. So in the example, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up to 100, I can calculate the average of that entire set simply by looking at the first and the last numbers, 1 and 100, and asking, well, what's their average? In this case, the average is 101 divided by 2, which is 50.5. So if 50.5 is the average, then I multiply by 100, which is the number of elements in the set. That takes 50.5 and turns it into 5,050, which is the number we're looking for. I love it. I love it. That is a completely different way to approach the problem. Also pretty simple and quick and gives you the same answer. Yeah, totally. Very crisp. I love it. So Noah, let me put a bow on this by saying that in general, if you had the numbers one plus two plus three up to some variable endpoint, let's call it N, and you wanted to know what is the sum of those, well, we've told you how Gauss might have done it when n is 100, in general, the sum comes out to a very nice formula, namely n times n plus 1, all divided by 2. So very concise, very straightforward. Cool. So why did I think of Gauss when thinking about the problem related to the number of gifts the singer gets from his true love? Do you see a connection? I sort of do, but I don't think it's going to be enough to get me to the final answer. And let me explain what I mean. On any given day, I think I could use the method from the Gauss story to figure out how many gifts the singer got on that day. Like, for example, on the fifth day of Christmas, the singer got one plus two plus three plus four plus five gifts. So one plus five is six. Two plus four is six. Three, well, not three plus three, because there's only one three. Ah, but you yourself invented a way out of this conundrum, right? Oh, my zero trick. All right, let me try this again. So instead of adding one plus two plus three plus four plus five, I'm going to add 
zero plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So zero plus five is five. One plus four is five. And three plus two is five. Three fives comes out to a total of 15. So I know that on the fifth day, the singer got 15 gifts, but I'm not seeing how I could use that same method to figure out how many gifts they got over the entire 12 days. Because if I take the number of gifts from each day, that doesn't make an arithmetic sequence, does it? No, it creates something different. And in fact, we are going to leave it a little bit open so that our listeners can have a chance at solving the rest of the problem. Okay, but you know what, Pete? Our listeners are pretty savvy. I'd like to challenge them a little more than asking them to just add up a whole bunch of numbers. Is there a way we could maybe make this a little bit more challenging? Yeah, I think there is. So let's make this the challenge. I am interested in knowing how many gifts the singer gets from their true love. But more than that, I'm interested in a formula that takes in some number of days and then tells me what the total number of gifts would be. So this formula, if I plug in 12, would answer the question for the song. But what if there were 24 days in Christmas? Or there are eight days in Hanukkah. Maybe we have a Hanukkah variation of this puzzle. And it involves giving gifts in the same pattern up through eight days. I'd like to know, Math Club, what formula can you come up with that produces the number of gifts? So we're asking our listeners to come up with a function that you could plug in any number and get the answer of how many gifts would be given in that many days. Exactly. And you know what I think would be very cool? I will post the statement of the puzzle on our Twitter page at Math Club Podcast. And then we'll leave it up to folks to go there and submit answers by responding to the tweet. That sounds great. You know, I also know that there are a lot of people these days who have been moving away from Twitter. So just in case we have listeners who aren't on Twitter who want to submit an answer, you can go ahead and go to this link. It's bit.ly slash mathclubpodcast dash puzzle three. And we'll also put that link in our show notes. Cool. And no matter how you submit your answer to us, whether it's on Twitter or via our Google form, whoever is the first listener to submit a valid function that produces the correct answer will get a shout out on our next episode. You know, speaking of shout outs, Noah, I think you and I are due for a shout out to our musical arranger. You're absolutely right, Pete. We are. We want to give a huge math club thank you to Stefan Gilbert O'Neill. Not only is he the person that arranged the intro and outro music that you hear on most of our episodes, he also came up with the holiday version of our theme song that we used on this episode. So Stefan, from us to you, a million thanks. And I might even be sending you some birds. Hey Noah, I've got a question. When your true love sends you all those Lords of Leapin, where are they gonna stay? Like, do you have the guest room set up? No, but I'm already getting a deal for buying all of these bird cages in bulk, so I think I could just get a few extra large ones for them. Oh yeah, pillows, blankets, those lords are going to be fine. All right, Math Club, please make sure to have a very happy holiday. Season's greetings, Math Club, to you and your families and everyone you care about. We'll see you next time.